And don't worry, you won't have to know about these lawsuits. They'll be dealt with in secret international tribunals by professional arbitrators, not meddlesome Canadian judges. Wait, what happens when we lose a lawsuit? What do you mean when? You've already paid out millions under NAFTA. This is the same, only more confidential. And again, the internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. If I were the man I was five years ago, I'd take a flame through to this place. When you're, when you're telling these little stories, here's a good idea. Have a point. It makes it so much more interesting for the listener. I wouldn't trust this overgrown pile of microchips any further than I can throw it. There's a force in the universe. I yeah. All you have to do is get in touch with me. Stop thinking. Let things happen. Be the ball. There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? Welcome to Disc Culture for the week of October the 31st, 2012. It's a very spooky episode from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm Anthony Marco! From downtown Toronto, uh, where they're not zombies, they're just the presenters of Entertainment Tonight Canada. I'm Andrew Curry. Uh, here in Owen Sound, where we had no trick-or-treaters, this is Ryan Wiseman. It's, is it because you've been tricking them for too many years, Ryan? <laughs> No, again, it's the fact that I'm surrounded by lawyers and the cops. See that lake over there, kids? There's candy at the bottom. <laughs> Shh, Trick. No one listen to him. You are listening to Discultured episode number 209. You can find the podcast every week by going to Discultured.com. You can uh, subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher or podcast aggregator by typing in Discultured. You can email us at Discultured at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at Discultured. Or submit links for next week's show, episode 210, into our subreddit at discultured.reddit.com. But when you spell discultured, you must always do so with the letter Y. Why is that, Mr. Andrew Curry? Why don't I tell you a quick Halloween story? Uh, this is fresh off the presses uh, and a little bit personal. Uh, maybe about five years ago, uh, I buried the cat I had at the time up at my mom's place. Uh, mom lives in, um, up North Toronto, uh, at the foot of a weeping willow tree. Uh, very sweet. Got the ashes from the, um, uh, vet and then put the, uh, later there to rest because she was like, she was a house cat. She grew up in my mom's place, yada, yada, yada. So cut to Monday as Sandy's blowing through, uh, guess what happens? Uh, that willow tree gets uprooted, smashes the garage, uh, and causes all sorts of carnage. I can only assume uh, it's so that the ashes of my cat could rise again and reformulate to form a zombie cat <laughs> that will come downtown and terrorize my current cat. So more on that as it develops. <laughs> Are you trying to create a new zombie cat meme? Is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> I won't say no. <laughs> I can have zombie cat. Uh, what did we listen to off the top, Mr. Curry? Uh, that was, I think you found that. It was on YouTube. It's uh, it's by a delightful comedy troupe out of the west coast of Canada. Uh, they call themselves Deep Rogue Ram. Uh, they have a Tumblr site, uh, deeprogram.tumblr.com. This is a YouTube video all about the joys of the Canada-China Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Agreement. So we heard just a little snippet of that, but I encourage you to watch the whole video. It's only about two minutes long, and you'll get the gist of it. Yeah, it's very much done in the style of uh, the conservative type of ads that they put out whenever they try and promote something these days. So it's, it's very much like a, uh, a government-style ad, and then all of a sudden it takes a bit of a turn. And the acronym for that is FIPA. 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 Yeah. So I've, to I've seen it with one P and with two P's, so I'm not sure which one it is. But. Ooh, maybe it's both. Yeah. Um, but it, it 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 looks really really shady. This uh, this trade agreement and. Uh, oh, I thought you were talking about the video. No, no. <laughs> it could it could use some production values. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. If you guys um, want to borrow a camera, you kids out there on the West Coast, let me know. Hey, but it's Creative Commons, okay? Actually, the music's Creative Commons in there that they used. All right. Oh, See? That's good. There we go. So instantly, we got to have some credibility there. So that's FIPA. Yeah, that's our government trying to basically fuck us over with a trade deal with China. Not necessarily a free trade deal with China, but if you look at the video, you see one of the interesting things that it brings up is the fact that um, if China feels like we've reneged on any of the provisions of the deal, they can sue us in an international court and the trial will be held in secrecy. 
that's I mean that's going on right now under NAFTA. That, that same stipulation exists, and the secrecy is the we we just didn't care or know about it. Well, I I don't think they're obligated to report on it. That's the thing. I have no idea, but. Oh, and if you do go to the YouTube link, you can also find uh, there's a link to a site called lead, leadnow.ca, and you can spam Prime Minister Harper. So I guess that, well, that's, that's kind of cool. That's good. Yeah. Why don't they just have spamharper.com? Registering it right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's all it does. You have like 65 buttons on the front screen, and every button you press sends an email to Harper about something. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we can get some people to donate on a uh, botnet. I think so. Use. Yeah. It's like... I want more zombie cats in Canada. <laughs> Done. 60, 65 million Canadians agree. Wait, 650 <laughs> billion Canadians who live in eastern Russia agree. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, what is with the CRTC? We'll find out in a section of the show that we like to call Canada. Canada haunts me. Oh, that's so perfect for tonight. <laughs> I like the little uh, DJ scratch there, too. <laughs> um, so, the CRTC over the past couple weeks has given me cautious optimism. Now, if you remember, three, uh, three chairmen's back, we had Ervon Finkenstein! Which, again, that re- rendition of the name is perfect for tonight. Uh, then we had uh, Lenny Smelly Cats. Do we have smelly cats, by the way, Ryan? Do we have smelly cats? Yeah. Smelly cat, smelly cat, what are they feeding you? Everybody! Smelly cat, smelly cat, it's not your fault. I remember smelly cats. And now we have J.P. Blais, who over the past few weeks has done some pretty amazing things, including this week at a news conference said, well... If we're going to allow these smaller telecoms into the country and we're going to force the bigger telecoms to sell wholesale to them, I'm thinking it would be pretty fair to know exactly how much it costs them and how much their upcharges are. That's got to be scary for some people, Andrew. It's scary for me because uh, the first reaction I can think if I were a big telecom company is, fine, we're not going to sell wholesale internet or telephony to any smaller player. That's awesome. See ya. Yeah. Closed door lock. Um, the CRCC could order them, though. Well, I think this should, shouldn't should depend in any way, manner, shape, or form on wholesale. Like, I would imagine that Bell might make a little more money off of uh, a company like Tech Savvy than they might off of, uh, I don't know, a small um, swath of, like, the Canadian populace. Nevertheless, I think they should be open and transparent regardless. should have nothing to do with Tech Savvy or uh, any of the smaller telcos or anyone else. They should be... They should be forced to open their books so that Canadians could see just how much they're paying and why. The estimate here, this is uh, by uh, Jason Magder. He's a reporter for the Montreal Gazette. Uh, his own estimation, and it's, you know, you can take it for what it's worth. He estimates that Bell's lowest tier internet is marked up by a rate of over 6,000%. 6,452% for Bell's Essential Plus plan, uh, which is priced at $28.95 a month for uh, two megabits per second and presumably like, I don't know, a 10 megabyte cap or something. So which way does that go after that? Does it get, is it marked up less on faster, better plans or more? Uh, if you follow Apple's logic, what do they do? They sort of, they, they price something that's like affordable just to make you want the higher price thing more. So they got to right? give you a middle. Yeah, right. I'm just wondering about. I'll, I'll see what uh, the here. I'll continue. You go. <laughs> I'm, re- I'm researching. You uh, you talk. Well, so it's, no, it says that's that, the only. Yeah, it says there near the bottom of the say, article that open. Leslie Pinto from OpenMedia.ca says that we have been able to guess that it costs between one and eight cents to provide a gigabyte of internet service. And with this decision, they're going to get closer to figuring out the true cost. One and eight cents per gigabyte. So. Really, um, think about how much you pay for a data plan. And that should tell you exactly how much you're paying. Yep. Even if it's eight cents. <laughs> let's let's go with the higher number. Um, that's utterly ridiculous. Now, 
I, you know what the, the, the big telecoms, they're going to say, oh, yeah, but we have to. We have to put in everything. We have to install everything. And, and look, we get giant events like Hurricane Sandy knocking down all of our towers. What are we supposed to do? See? The big defense. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, they were the first, uh, I mean, they offered internet and were able to get um, wireless spectrum back when there wasn't auctions for well, exactly. said products, they right? Were, so they, they just helped themselves. The spectrum, yeah. Right, yeah. So, you know, it all balances out, I think. And okay. the other thing is that, you know, it's a competition thing. Like, okay, Tech Savvy can't afford at the moment to build its own in- infrastructure, but it's never going to be able to unless it has an opportunity to make enough profit to start doing so, right? Yeah. The only other option is to have something like Win Mobile, where it's completely foreign-owned and, uh, you know, they use Huawei equipment. So, oh, my God, China's spying on my SMS. It's not China. It's the Chinese military. Oh, all right. I feel better. Let's be clear. Or whoever's paying the Chinese military for the <laughs> technology. Dun, dun, dun. Well, <laughs> we'll see what happens out of this. I mean, I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's great that they're doing it. I, I don't have the fear that you do, Andrew, that, that the, big company, the big companies may threaten to not sell it to the, to the other providers. But I think the CRTC will just order them to or they'll take the Spectrum away. I mean, I think that the CRTC, if it wants to, if it's really waving this this Thor's hammer of power, pardon the analogy, um, if if they're willing to go there, then they better be willing to go there fully. Like, you can't go there and then all of a sudden they say, well, then we're not going to sell them. And the CRTC goes, oh, okay. Well, let me put my argument another way. Say you have a child and the child has uh, explosive diarrhea at the dinner table. And all of a sudden, one day, the child no longer has the symptoms that uh, result in explosive diarrhea. It's not a great, it, it's great that the explosive diarrhea stops, but it never should have been there in the first place. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I think that's all we need. Uh, the Toronto Star. Yeah, we're going to have to start up, a, we're going to have to start up some kind of paywall uh, stinger, I think. It seems like every week now we're getting a new paywall. The Star, the Toronto Star, is starting up their new paywall. Now, they've been experimenting with a paywall on the Hamilton Spectator, which is part of Metroland News, which is the kind of uber publishing division of the Star. So there have been other Star papers that have moved to this. Uh, There is a solution to this, folks. If you download a browser that has any kind of incognito window, you can open as many articles as you want to by just right-clicking on a link instead of regular clicking on it. Yeah, I have a problem with that. Um, to me, that's disrespecting the user. I mean, sure, like these paywalls are easily circumvented, and they're stupid, obviously. Well, but but to that, ask... that's, that's my argument against having the paywall, because it's so ridiculous. Right. But so what, uh, what I'd like to propose, and I, and I open this up for discussion, here's my feeling on it. The fact, the fact of the matter to me, the way I see this, Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail basically said, we don't want you on our site for free. I'm entirely okay with that. Uh, as a matter of fact, over the weekend, the number one story, the front page news on the star.com was a fight that broke out at a pho restaurant in Chinatown that was on Reddit that you know people were laughing at because it was basically like two girls kind of having, having a hissy fit and everybody else in the restaurant going, whoa, that was front page news in the Toronto Star. So I'm entirely fine. If Toronto Star wants to have a paywall and they don't want me on their site, I'm okay with that. What I do have a problem with is uh, if we put links from the Star and we put links in the Globe Mail on our site, and a month from now somebody discovers our podcast, they go to click on a link and the link doesn't work, and for whatever reason they don't have the wherewithal to to use or invoke the incognito browsing, that's a disservice to our to our listeners, I think, and I don't think that's right. I my solution, and I'm going to put this out there up for discussion. I think we should boycott the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail because, quite frankly, this type of news can be uh, received from multiple sources. Uh, I would agree that we could certainly do our homework to look for alternate sources. I think that on some of the bigger stories, um, you're always going to find that they're not necessarily written by the Star or that they're not written by the Globe, that they're probably written by the Canadian Press or the Associated Press or Reuters or whatever it is. Um. I don't think we should not bring a story just because we can't find a link other than the star. But maybe we should just say, um, maybe instead of a link that goes back to the original newspaper, we provide a link that has a search string in it so that when people click on it, it brings up something else in Google or something else in DuckDuckGo. 
Sure, but again, that's requiring more from our listeners. Oh, I'm not. Try, I'm not defending the paywall here. Right. I'm not defending so, and, the paywall by any means. And but. like, so, so this means something especially to me because I'm the curator of the show notes for now, right? So it's like, there, and I can think of it a specific example. A week or two ago, I think uh, Jim Henshaw put a link in the Reddit, and so I went to click on it, and I put it in the show notes, and then like half an hour before we were starting to record, it was a uh, it was a Wall Street Journal link. So I went to open it, and it's like it wouldn't open. I'm like, oh fuck! So I had to go and I found I had to find like another alternative for the same story. And that's the thing: if you go search Google News for any headline you will find multiple sources because the vast majority of news Canadian and, and otherwise comes through Reuters and uh, Associated Press and other news services I, I can't remember what the Canadian one is even even hand. better sure than the headlines ones. just in, drop an entire paragraph into Google like literally cut and paste an entire paragraph and drop it into Google and you'll find the article better because sometimes they shift up the headlines right like every newspaper will write its own headline for the piece but oftentimes right. they take the copy directly from the original source yeah, so Ryan, I don't know. What do you think of this? Do you think we're disrespecting our listeners by making them circumvent paywalls? Or should we honor the Globe and Mail and the Star when they clearly don't want freeloaders like us on their site, on their um, awesome news site? I'm, I got so many things going on. One, I think someone needs to make a Dropbox app that allows you to instantaneously save page as to a zip that goes into Dropbox and then gives you a, in your clipboard little paste. How awesome would that be? Bam. So you can just steal that whole page from behind the paywall once you're in. Well, uh, in, in, I don't know. In, I like the idea. Could that, couldn't we? Could you just right click on the page and go save as? Yeah, it just has four more steps than just like a. Yeah. <sighs> I'm sure that, there's scripts out there yeah. that would suck up entire websites like one of the hourly. things. One of the things that, uh, well, um, Ant said, if people you know find links and send it in, well, we're going to have less people submitting links from these sources anyways, just because they're going to be behind a paywall, so people aren't going to necessarily go there to get the info. I don't know, like. It kind of seems like a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in the star is still going to be in the open, and by the article, it really seems like they're going to dive into new, richer stuff behind the scenes in this, you know, like, you know, whatever you want to call it, the paid version of the site. And I don't, mi- I don't mind that. I'm going to play the other other side, and that that's going to resource independent guys like myself to go out and shoot local video stuff and what's going on in the scene in Toronto, etc. So there's something cool uh, to that, as well as people to cover real geeks, real niche geeks to cover topics. We'll, we'll see what they do with it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and, and as far as the, us in the show, uh, if we get a link to it and we can manage to talk a bit about it, that's the one thing for us. It doesn't matter that there's an article, really. Uh, if it makes sense to what we're talking about any given week, we'll just uh, we'll draw on the pieces we want, say our bit, and then you know move on to the next. Uh, topic right so in fairness like while uh while the discussion was going on i went to an old episode uh i think it was just 196 or something clicked on a random global mail link and it still works so either the global mail paywall really sucks or they're not implementing it site-wide or something's going on so well, it's they, not, they have it after a certain well, amount of articles right and they don't have a any reason to go and they don't necessarily have to go nix it all in the past to be mega assholes when there's links out there. They, the basis of the web is hypertext or linking, correct? So, like, maybe we don't have to break it there. But from now on, we can make it so that doesn't happen. We should just set maybe. up our own proxy server, I think. We should just start becoming a greater source of Canadian news. That way you can be anonymous whenever you're surfing the web. We should have the discultured proxy server, and then we can feed our web links through there. Yeah. Haywood has a good point in the chat. He asks, uh, how come we can just uh, subscribe to uh, individual reporter blogs? So why do we have to go through a middleman, the delivery system? Why can't we just find like, uh, if you remember, we were talking about the uh, plagiarism story. That was, uh, that all came from somebody's personal blog where they just went and fact checked the uh, star um, columnist or not the star, the uh, Globe Mail columnist. Well, I mean, the, re- right? the reason that you go to the star and the reason that you go to, to uh, the Globe or whatever is because they are the curators. They are the aggregators and they're not perfect by any means. They're not the best choice by any means, but if the purpose is to, if you would have to go out there and curate down a thousand or two thousand blogs every week, that would be that would for, be a lot of work. Storyfy, Storyful, that thing we just talked about, which is automating all that. Um, as far as the star goes, I follow two or three star uh, writers on Twitter, and uh, guess what? I get the articles as they're being built, and if I wanted to, I can share and be a part of it then and there. Like I say, if they came up with a if. It, 
you can't tell me that they're that if they really wanted to work on a half decent micropayment system, they couldn't do it. Like, I mean, I'm sorry, but if they would just say, look, you know, did you get something out of this article? Like, give us 10 cents, you know, and whatever system it was. And you don't have to, but I mean, you put the offer out there. Are you getting the value out of it to where you want to support them? I'm all for that, but. Oh, like if they offered a version without ads, it's like, hey, sign up for like two bucks a month and you'll never see an ad on our site again. It's like, yeah, okay, I'd consider it, but. Uh, in the case of the star, eh, it's I, I was quite surprised to read that it's apparently the most widely read newspaper in Canada, despite having the name Toronto in the title. I yeah. think it I think it's uh, pretty damning evidence against just the effectiveness of ads in the online space anyways. They can't they can't really sell the ads. They're not selling against this online content the way it is currently. Yeah, for sure. The, yeah. The, what happened behind the paywall, they're gonna turn it into T V you watch over time. I called it now. We'll see it in 12. We should get to a new section of the show, no? <laughs> <laughs> you mean a section of the show where we can hide behind our paywalls in a state of mind called privacy? Okay, so this week, Dean Del Mastro, who's a conservative MP in Ottawa, actually he's not from Ottawa, he's from Peterborough, uh, went into the house and basically said that the government should do something about anonymous online comments. And I'm going to come to this story from what I think is a different perspective a little bit from perhaps you two, I'm not sure. But in as much as I hate the concept of this, I teeter so closely on the edge to hating idiot commenters on newspaper websites even more than I hate the fact that we have the that they're talking about restricting anonymity. I think that people should be able to express themselves anonymously. There are reasons for that. But it has turned every single commenting board on every place I go to into almost absolute crap because nobody feels like they have to stand up for what they say and they tend to go over the top go ahead of course of course you know that all the commenters are actually reporters who make like an extra couple of cents here and there by writing troll comments well i know that don't you i know that a bunch of them do and i also know that when it comes to political stories you have a bunch of political wonks that work for parties that are told to go on and immediately comment as soon as the story comes up oh trust me trust me i know that because i know so i know some of them would do it but Right. intelligence involved but that's a whole other game but that being said I, I think comments underneath an article whether it be on a newspaper's website or dare I even say what YouTube should be let's say Vimeo I, comments I think are incredibly interesting and useful and they're part of the discussion and part of the conversation but when you have to weed through 150 uh idiot comments to try and find some great new information that somebody has offered up. It's, it's taking, taking the value out of it. If I have to spend 20 minutes just to find one thing in there, then all of a sudden it becomes not worth it anymore. So I, I, I'm not concerned about what they're saying. I'm just concerned about the fact that (laughs) can't we be smarter? (laughs) I I honestly think you're reading the wrong sites and I'm going to maybe, um, you know, sound like, uh, I don't know, I'm elitist or whatever, but I, the, the very fact that if I go to the Globe Mail or the Star and I have to register to post a comment, I think is complete bullshit. Uh, and for that reason alone, I refuse to comment. And so, uh, I just, it's too much of a hurdle. I remember, and I I feel like I've talked about this before, but way back about five years ago, uh, I put a comment in the Toronto Star and I actually got a phone call from somebody at the Star saying, yeah, we need to verify your identity. And I'm like, what are you fucking, are you kidding me? I gave you my email address. Could you not send an email? Do you, why do you have to call me on the phone? And of course, I neglected to f- remember that I actually had to give my phone number as part of the sign-up process to leave a comment on a stupid newspaper website. They don't do that it's, anymore, by the way. But no, but you still have to like you have to like l- registering for an account. It's the reason why I hate these uh, these commenting systems like Discuss and an intense debate and stuff. Like you should be my understanding, and I've been blogging for a number of years, so my understanding of comments is. There's a 
there's a tacit agreement between the commenter and the writer. Like, of course, the the author of the blog has their right to delete anything they don't like or, or want to for whatever reason or for no reason. Uh, they're under no obligation to publish every single thing. So if you're going to call me a douchebag just because I say something disparaging against Apple, I don't have to publish that. Uh, but in the same way, I'm not going to make you jump through hoops just to prove your identity. I'm going to trust that you're, you know, going to say something that's worth my time and worth the time of the people who read my blog. And if you don't, I might delete it. I might not. I might leave you out there hanging so that other people can come and tear a strip off of you. Um, and, and I think different sites around the web have very different commenting systems. Um, I remember, uh, I don't know this year, or last year, but when TechCrunch switched from their own comic commenting system to Facebook. And there was a, uh, I'm sure somebody wrote a story somewhere. I remember reading it about the fact that tech crunch comments went from being really, um, uh, you know, lots of flame bait and trolling to, uh, almost unnervingly positive because all of a sudden people had to use their Facebook accounts and I guess therefore had to prove their identity in some, uh, more specific way. So there's there's different kinds of commenting out there, and I don't I think I think it's dangerous to generalize. Uh, I can only comment about eh, I can only speak to the comments on newspaper sites, which I think are complete bullshit. So you're saying you're all for Facebook commenting? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I know. I'm joking. <laughs> I was writing a little note to myself, which was that I, I'm finding that like the private group Facebook interaction or private page, whatever that is. Uh, is an interesting space and it has more positive or just has positive community concepts. And to the YouTube sort of thing that Ant noted before, there are a lot of uh, YouTube channels that really do have community that is awesome. That is, there isn't even need to be a manager of things taking part because the people in the YouTube comments are taking any trolls. It's more of the one-off video that you get. I don't know. It, it, I think there's positive stuff out, out there. You just have to build it and maintain it. Um, I, I take a look at some of the arguments that, getting back to the story that Dean Del Master is making here, and he's saying, I mean, he's being oxymoronic here, but, you know, that's his own problem. Uh, While I believe that the right to free speech must be strongly defended and protected, I also believe it should be backed up by the common decency to stand by one's words as opposed to hiding behind online anonymity. First of all, there's nothing which says it has to be common decency that you can't be anonymous. Some people have to be anonymous just because they would be under threat if they were. There are plenty of places in the world where that's the case. And I would dare say there's probably plenty of places in Canada that we just might be unaware of where that's the case. Well, yeah, like the girl who committed suicide a couple of... uh, But jumping down to the next paragraph, see, and this is where he loses me. And this is where I I hate the... Anonymous online attacks are, in my view, cowardly, but that they are no less hurtful and represent a... Con- so he's pissed off because either someone's insulted him or, you know, something along those lines. And that's... That's... I mean, people get to express an opinion. I mean, I get that. I wish that people would do that. I wish that there was a methodology whereby you could say... Um, now, I'm noticing that some of the sites are policing themselves when... You know, the comments just get over the edge. And I, you know, even when you jump, sometimes when you jump onto Reddit, they even uh, do some moderation when people cross the line. I was I was just going to say, so there is, you know, there is a, um, what's the word? Back in the long, long ago, there were these things called forums and forums had moderators. Why can't the people, if you're talking about, uh, again, if you're talking about comments on a newspaper website, why can't the author of the article be on the hook to actually respond in the comments? There's nothing wrong with being a part of that conversation and say, you know what, this is getting off topic. You know what, that's irrelevant. You know what, you're being hurtful. Go away. There's nothing wrong with that. You can take part in the conversation. It's not like, okay, I've had my say. Now you have yours. Yeah. I'm going to go off and get my paycheck. The reporter, yeah, the reporters don't want to do that, though. They don't see it. Exactly. They don't see that because as part of their job. They don't, they don't see a newspaper's website as a social network, which it really isn't. It's a com- I mean, a comment engine alone doesn't make it social media. Um, but So they don't see that as their job. And if they were told to, I imagine they would, but then they're just going to use that as an argument. Well, I'm just going to be writing less articles then because I'm going to be commenting to people. Maybe I'm, that's not such a bad thing, talking about the maybe news not. cycle. <laughs> maybe not. Like I say, I, 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 I wish. It, it's not like I think it should be legislated in any way, shape, or form. I just wish people would. Because there's plenty of people out there who you know who are commenting and doing it anonymously or just doing it for the purposes of sniping. I just wish that people would actually put their name to what they actually think. 
Because then it allows me to respond properly sometimes. At least you know where they're coming from. <sighs> you need to spend more time on forums. Harness your flame, your flame baiting uh, skills. Yeah, I don't know about that. We'll have to see. <laughs> anyway, the uh, police chiefs met this week. And if you remember, there was a bill by Vic Taves that came out a while back called Bill C-30, which would give the police access to Internet communications without a warrant. And he kind of, remember, let that die off a little bit because there was some famous quote about being with the with them or with the child pornographers. And ever since then, he kind of backed off a bit. Well, the police chiefs of Canada want this brought back up again. They want access to all of your internet communications without a warrant. I can't see how that would be a problem, Andrew. Uh, well, especially when they bring up that, you know, um, the child pornography thing. Got to think of the children <laughs> because the only... The only way you can fight child pornography is by invasive surveillance. <laughs> All child <laughs> pornography will go away forever if you just let us watch over your internet and, s- and record all your online activities. Listen to the... G- <laughs> so they take... I, for- I forget what it's called. I- I'm losing all of my uh, my newspaper terms. But they've got the, uh, the quote that they pull out and put it in-, in larger text on the side. And this is by the Vancouver Deputy Police Chief Warren Lemke. Right now, there are gangsters out there communicating about killing someone, and we can't intercept that. Well, how does he know unless he's intercepting? (laughs) (laughs) He's a clairvoyant. (laughs) Apparently. How does he know? Future crime. (laughs) I mean, what does he think? That they're on Facebook? What do you think? What do you want to do tonight, Andrew? You want to go go whack somebody? Yeah, I'll I'll like that. (laughs) Okay, sounds good. Oh, nope. wait, the, the the chief of police wants to be our friend. I'm not going to allow him to friend us. No, but if we can get 10 likes on this, I swear I'm going to go do it. <laughs> well, sounds good. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, you don't stop criminals by being able to look at communications. Because once the bill gets passed, then guess what? They just find better, more sneaky ways to communicate. And they're probably already doing it. You're not going to catch anybody being that dumb. Again, like yeah, if you knew the if you knew what the fuck you were doing, you would you know beat them at their own game. There's nothing saying that you can't use the same tools that cyber criminals are. We're going to be hearing cyber a lot tonight, especially in the next story. So. Yeah, we are. Just I'm just, just getting you ready for it. Yeah. Just to clarify, Section 34 of Bill C30 says the following. That the bill would give any government appointed agent, not necessarily the police, any government appointed agent who may or may not be a police or intelligence officer, the right to access and copy any information and documentation collected by internet providers and telecommunications companies without the need for a warrant, judicial oversight, or even a criminal investigation. Wow. But... To remind everyone, C-30 right now is stalled in the Senate or the House of Commons, and based on the public outcry, the prognosis is not good. I don't know. They've got a majority. They don't have to stop for any reason. And uh, the the guy who they show in the picture at the top of the article speaking, which is, uh, uh, let me see, something, something Jim Chu, Vancouver Police Chief Jim Chu, uh, says he agrees that Section 34 is problematic. Maybe he agrees it's problematic. Well, that's good. <laughs> maybe he agrees it's problematic because maybe there's a whole bunch of people who are actually law enforcement types that don't like the idea of a government agent being able to search all of their communications without a warrant. You know? Now you're just blowing my mind. <laughs> you just blew my mind, man. Oh, dear. Okay, let's continue. The U.S. and Canada launch a joint cybersecurity plan. That should be enough to scare the shit out of anybody. Uh, Canada, this is a quote from Public Safety Minister Vic Taves, the aforementioned genius behind Bill C-30. Canada and the U.S. have a mutual interest in partnering to protect our shared infrastructure. We are committed to working together to protect vital cyber systems, to respond to and recover from any cyber disruptions, and to make cyberspace safer for all of our citizens. Oh, it doesn't stop there. Washington and Ottawa hope to improve collaboration on managing cyber incidents between their respective cybersecurity <laughs> operation centers, enhance information, cyber sharing, and cyber engagement with the cyber sector, and pursue U.S. Canadian cyber collaboration to promote cybersecurity awareness to the cyber public cyber. Is Vic Taves a character in Necronomicon? 
that's uh, that's too kind. <laughs> um, the fact that this is being at a press conference with uh, Janet Napolitano, the Homeland Security Secretary in the states. Oh dear, and she used the word robust. <laughs> The plan reinforces the robust relationship between the two agencies. Yeah, I noticed they also mentioned uh, Huawei and ZTE. Yes, they did. So, of course, uh, uh, eh. I, I feel like we've talked about this before. Uh, I'm sure. We, I think we talked about it as they were getting it together, but they've actually launched it, it sounds like, at this point. So, Right. Well, at the very least, maybe if someone, if there is a cyber attack, air quotes, I don't know if you heard that, uh, <laughs> there's a cyber attack on Canada, you know, but after the hours of uh, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., hopefully someone will be there to intercept it. Exactly. I think I, they just forward it. They're doing call forwarding to the U.S. cyber <laughs> There you go. That, that's it. They're outsourcing the cyber that's security. Like, yeah, t- truthfully, it would cost more to do it in the States. <laughs> yeah, the States has probably also said it there's the India, too. <laughs> um. Another, we've talked about topics like this many times before. A British Columbia teen was arrested for photographing a mall takedown. So they actually show the picture uh, in this article, which is uh, from the CBC News. A 16-year-old basically saw something going down. He thought it was interesting, thought it was newsworthy of a man being arrested by security guards. Took a picture, and then the guards turned on him, demanding he delete the photo. And as he turned to leave, the RCMP arrived, <laughs> pushed him to the ground, and tried and tried to grab his camera. And he was taken outside to an RCMP cruiser and mall, and mall security. This is insane. Not really. Private space. The part of it is insane. The part about like you know hauling him down and asking him to leave. People forget when you're when you're in a shopping mall or. Especially a shopping mall. People think it's like, oh, it's a wonderful place. We can gather, meet your friends, and go and shop and worship at the altar of Apple and Mrs. Fields and everything else. But the fact of the matter is you're on private property. And so people can kick you out for any reason or for no reason. Uh, you may not know this, but I am banned from the Eaton Center for Life here in downtown Toronto. And the reason <laughs> why, why doesn't that surprise me at all? Either. In, <laughs> in 1997, I was... Uh, back when, when I you were was, a hoodlum? No, I was quite fond of rollerblading. I used to take uh, great pleasure rollerblading through the downtown path system, which basically connects all the office buildings and shopping centers together. I used to go in the middle of winter on a Sunday afternoon and uh, basically go from the Sheraton Center that Anth has been to many times right down to Union Station through a series of interconnected hallways and such. And it was great fun. Did you, sorry, did you now. rollerblade in like uh, in gym shorts with like a headset and nothing else? No, 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 no. <laughs> I was I had a, <laughs> a bit more modesty than that. Anyway, so cut to I was doing this in the Eaton Center and these security guys come up to me and they say, Well, you gotta leave and I'm like, You gotta take those things off and get out of here. And I'm like, Well, I don't have shoes and they're like, Well, you've gotta leave and I'm like, Well, you're gonna have to carry me then <laughs> So they didn't like that. And of course, I'm with a buddy. I'm with my buddy from Second City. And so we're just like, we're laughing our asses off at this. So at one point he goes, you're banned for life. And uh, Albert Howell, devil's advocate number two, uh, turned to the guard and said, oh, what? He's banned because he hurt your feelings? He said, you're banned for life too. (laughs) So we started yelling out, hey, they're banning people for life for free. Come on over, get yours. And many laughs were had. And then we left when we got tired. The comedian, yeah. So, so the issue about the um, you know not being allowed to take cameras or not being allowed to take f- uh, photos in in a private space, which is what a mall is, that that is acceptable to me because I understand it. Um, asking you to delete photos in a film camera is kind of retarded. Um, the the last part of the story is uh, that this person. Um, He's got an Eastern European name. I can't remember. He's a 16 year old kid. And he wants to be a journalist, too. So it's like, you know, tugs at the heartstrings of, of well, yeah. journalists. So his name is like uh, Jacob Markovitz. Yeah, he did a better job of that than I could. So uh, apparently, when he went out to see the RCMP, uh, somebody somewhere decided that they wanted to search his knapsack. And that I have a problem with. Apparently, they couldn't get it off. So they just like, they slashed the um, straps and then they just searched it. Sounds an awful lot like G20. So I'm not sure where the law stands between like, okay, you're in. You're you're in a private space, and yet, presumably, you would have some rights to your own personal property. So for me, draw the line. It's like, okay, you see, I can't take photos in here. Fine, I'll go out and stand on a public street and take photos with a zoom lens or infrared camera or whatever. But if you want to search my private person and if you want to touch me physically, I don't believe you have the right to do that. 
I've got, unless you're placing me under arrest. I've got no problem with the fact that they asked him to leave. I mean, it was you're right, it's private property. But you can't tell me that there is a precondition set up in that mall whereby people can't take pictures. Because I bet you there are high school kids running around that mall 24-7 snapping pictures of each other or stuff that they like. There is no, There cannot be a rule in that mall about nobody taking pictures. Oh, I'm sure there is. It's only enforced, however, when the circumstances don't reflect kindly on the mall, right? So the whole reason this happened is because this kid witnessed an arrest, took a photo of it, and it looked like you know the guards have this unidentified person like pinned down so you know they didn't like that because number one the guards are identified you could use like a uh, google face search to find out their identities uh so so that was their problem and you know it yeah it sucks but it's private property however once you take a photo now that photo is your personal property so i would argue that it's like uh you know what you can't do anything about it and by the way it's already uploaded to the internet so fuck yeah, you and especially when the camera's already in his bag i got one word about the whole thing and it's tact right these guys just fucking blew it the way they handled it they got aggressive and all security guardy they could have been like there's a whole bunch you know that this could have been handled in a wholly different situation with just like hey can you hang your man oh it's a film camera okay cool we're just gonna take care of this just chill for a minute we'll be with you or it could have be- it could have even just been like look this is private property you've taken a picture which includes the faces of two of our security guards we don't consider that acceptable you know, I'm not saying that the guy would have listened, but you're right. There are many different ways that this could have been handled. You don't – to treat someone like a criminal for taking a picture is ridiculous. You're treating them like a criminal kind of just for going to the mall, right? Because you're being, uh, you're being uh, videoed and identified soon enough by the cameras around. Oh, my mind's being blown again. <laughs> what if I didn't take a picture? What if I actually just took out a camera and snapped the flash? Then you could be arrested for threatening to take a picture. (laughs) (laughs) Intent. Take a video because you can you can put it away and you still have uh, audio. If I can say one final thing on this, uh, having been a security guard on a couple of occasions in my in my younger days, on uh, on rollerblades. No, no, that was before I was cool. So uh, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, security guards out there who really wanted to be cops, but for uh, reasons that will become apparent, um, couldn't be. (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. You've also included a uh, video link here, too, to an episode of The Agenda. You want to tell people about that if they want to go check it out after? Oh, yeah, real quick. It's um, And this is interesting because the, com- the comment we got in the blog last week about um, using YouTube as a distribution system because you can link to specific parts of a video, I actually did this. So there's an episode, just by strange coincidence, I was watching The Agenda last night. They're talking about Ontario Place, but this guy... Uh, I don't have his name handy, but he's in the video. He's talking about um, this very thing, that people mistake private spaces for public space. And it's just a little clip. And uh, if you click on it, it'll start about 20 minutes in. So, uh, you know, the technology's there. So consider that a little bit of a demonstration. But it's an interesting little clip if you want to, you know, have this idea of private space and public space reinforced. It, it's unfortunate that... Um, a lot of the places in um, you know Canada we think of as public places or at least semi-public and they're not and that's something we should really think about because I think public space is uh, endangered um, in a lot of ways so uh, it would be sad to see it go and you know be subject to security guards no matter where you go it's uh, Dave Meslin at Meslin is the guy Toronto oh great so. uh, cool thanks for that do you use uh, Google face recognition for that uh, yes just, uh, okay, I'm, I'm making a point. I'm going back to the article here. So if this guy's story is right, if the kid's story is right, he turned to leave the mall. And they held him, attempted to grab his camera, and they seized him as he turned to leave the mall. As far as I'm concerned. No, hang on. He turned to leave the mall and he, sl- he took a second picture, right? As the RCMP arrived, admittedly. But is that reason to seize him? Cops don't like it when you take pictures of them oh, because I, I all of a sudden that. they become people. But what I'm... <laughs> they become people that could be identified and humiliated like Officer Bubbles. Okay. I, I had another point, but I'm going to let it wrap up. No, no, go for it. No, 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 no. I'm not, it's, not that I'm, it's not because of what you said necessarily. I'm just saying that the, the entire point is the focus shouldn't be on whether he took a picture or not. The focus should be on that the infraction of taking a picture, if it is indeed an infraction should not involve anybody laying their hands on somebody. 
I mean, you want to escort this guy out and make sure he leaves? That's fine. But you should still not be able to put your hands on him. Because that's assault. I agree. And if he's not going to charge him with assault, well, then that's a different story altogether. In case falls, we just, we just don't have to go there. Um, what happens when you sometimes watch the police and the something, I'm doing something? It's a tax man. Watch the police and the tax man miss me. Oh, well, they didn't have a big announcement because of Hurricane Sandy, but they had a cyber announcement, Andrew. Oh, yeah. and suppose uh, technically, and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of Nexus was brought out, and I'm pretty excited about the phone. Um, wh- why don't you tell me why I should be excited about some of the other stuff too? Even though I'm thinking this could be my new phone. No, I'd, I'd like to talk about the phone first because I'm, you know, uh, always in the market for a new phone, let's be honest. Uh, and uh, the Nexus line of phones is uh, very compelling for a number, number of reasons. First and foremost, they're sold unlocked. Um, the past two Nexus phones, um, the Nexus S and the Galaxy Nexus, uh, were both uh, sold through Canadian carriers, and a lot of people didn't realize them, but they were unlocked. So you could go to a Telus store. Uh, you would have to sign up for like a Telus contract, presumably, but you could walk out of there with a Telus store, put in your SIM from Fido or Wind or Mobilisty and whatever else, and you'd be good to go. A lot of people didn't realize that. So that's the first great thing. And the fact that Google was able to do that and get uh, carriers in Canada and the States, uh, I believe, to sell this phone unlocked was was a pretty major achievement. Uh, the second thing um, is that uh, if you're uh, if you want the pure Android experience, like you don't like the um, customizations that manufacturers do, uh, and I'm not talking about the carrier stuff because that's a whole other ballpark. And some carriers do do that. Uh, Verizon, I think, is notorious for that in the states. Um, but if you talk about like HTC has uh, uh, Sense, uh, Samsung has TouchWiz, the sort of uh, skins, I guess launchers, if you will, that the uh, manufacturers put on Android. If you're not a fan of that, you want updates, and you want updates directly from Google uh, in a timely fashion. Nexus phones are also amazing for that. Uh, You don't have any carrier bloat. You don't have any bloat from any skins from Android, and you get your updates directly from Google as soon as they're available. Uh, The third reason is maybe compelling to a smaller group of people, but very compelling to me. Uh, All Nexus phones ship with an unlocked bootloader, and what that means is that it's extremely easy to take control of the device get root access and then uh, because it's a nexus phone you are automatically guaranteed to have the widest available selection of custom roms uh, for your device so what sucks about this phone is that it's a lucky gold star phone um, I, I saw something in the verge they did a really good piece where they were actually led into google headquarters and they were talking to um the guy's name is matthias duarte he's like the lead engineer designer or whatever for google and he actually had the phone and it's it's not bad looking. Like it's got Gorilla Glass front and back. It's got this sort of weird design in the back plate or whatever, and the uh, the screen actually curves around the front of the device so you can swipe or do gestures like right from the edge kind of thing. It looks like it's it looks like it's well made. Um, it has. Um, a non-removable battery, which is not so good in my opinion. The trade-off is is that you get a bigger battery. And if you didn't know, if you hadn't used Android before, Android kind of sucks for battery life. Uh, kind of sucks a lot. So, so that's sort of win lose, I guess. Uh, and um, the other potentially bad thing is that there's no removable storage. This is again, this is a Nexus thing. Uh, it's uh, actually turns out to be a good thing because the way the disk image is laid out on the phone, um, a lot of people when they don't have enough uh, built-in storage in the phone, they have lots of room for photos on their SD cards, but they don't have a lot of room for apps. So they run out of room for apps. So because the way the memory is laid out on the handset. All of the memory is available for it to, to be used by photos, podcasts, videos, apps, whatever you want. So that's good. What's bad is that uh, the phone only comes in 8 and 16 gigabyte storage versions. Uh, 32 would be nice. Um, but the another big plus about the phone is that it's incredibly cheap. I think it's going to sell directly from Google for 359 bucks, and that's unlocked. Uh, comes right from Google. It might be subject to shipping charges, which kind of sucks. I'm kind of hoping myself that Canadian carriers end up offering this maybe in the new year. I might even be willing to hold out until Wind sells it, and then I can get one subsidized, possibly. It'll still be unlocked, so that's not a problem. Uh, and I got the warranty straight from my carrier, which I think is good. But uh, all in all, a very compelling phone and something I am seriously considering for my next device. 
Uh, Real Mike M in the chat does mention that they made the decision not to go to LTE, which I, I guess is a bit surprising, considering it's almost it's almost becoming de rigueur among smartphones these days. Not so. It's for I'm saying almost. Yeah, but it's <laughs> well, it's it's the networks. There's a lot of networks out there that don't support LTE yet. Uh, and the ones that do, at least in the States, I believe it's the CDMA carriers like Verizon and Sprint, they're not even bothering. Like, there, there's no Sprint or Verizon compatible version of this phone. Now, is, the, is there an empirical reason why you doubt Gold Star? Don't get me wrong, I understand that Gold Star is the cheaper brand, it's no Samsung, all that kind of stuff. But if the stories are true and all of the parts are coming out of the same factories anyway, uh, with regards to phones, do you have a specific reason why the Gold Star thing bothers you? No, just based on you know, based on what I've heard, that people's like mm, LG. Some people I know like LG. Uh, you know, a, a few people here and there. The the other thing I guess to consider is that uh, when the first Nexus phone came out, the Nexus One, it was made by HTC, and it was um, uh, pretty instrumental in getting them sort of uh, known to a wider audience, and they experienced a lot of success based on uh, the Nexus One phone. In the same way. When the Samsung uh, took over the Nexus line, when they released the Nexus S, it was kind of their Cinderella moment, I guess, as they were kind of coming in uh, to, to a wider perception of being known as a quality phone maker. So the same might very well happen for LG. I've never had an LG phone, so I can't say. Hmm, interesting. I'm going to have to, I, I, I definitely want to see one of these things when it comes out and try it out. Because I like the idea of the, the, you know, the pure Google device, so to speak. Or as pure yeah, as so anyway. so for me, my, my options for a phone are completely different. Like there's this as a contender, and the other one is the Galaxy Note 2, which is completely different. Uh, and I actually was walking by a Best Buy today, and I went in, and they had one. And it's it's big. Like it's cool because it's big, but it's big to the point of not being able to use it with one hand. And that's – I don't know if I like that. You want to say the word, don't you? It's a phablet. <sighs> <laughs> Seven for 200 bucks. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. So they've lowered the prices on the 16-gigabyte uh, uh, 7-inch tablet, and then they're coming out with the 32-gigabyte one for a little more, and then they got Samsung uh, to make them a 10-inch one, and apparently it's got the same... Uh, what Samsung did is they ported the chip they use in the latest iPhone to uh, to Android, basically. I mean, it's not like you need any special modifications. It's just that basically the chip they made for Apple, they're now making in their own device, so... Um, that's kind of expensive. I don't know if I need that certainly right away, but you know, it's interesting. I still don't have the use case for um for a tablet yet. So maybe one day, yeah. but not yet. Someone's furiously scrolling in the background, by the way. <laughs> that that's me. <laughs> Just want to make sure I'm not uh, missing anything. But if if you want to know more about it, there's a, there's a really honestly amazing piece that The Verge did. Uh, you can find it on their site. It's something if you search for like inside Google or something. It's like a 15 minute video uh, where they talk to like the lead designers and engineers and stuff. And it, it's interesting the process. So what they do is they basically they look for manufacturing partners uh, who are willing to work with them. It's not just kind of like they hold a lottery and they say, okay, LG, you get to make the next Nexus phone. They have a very active part in the design of the phone in the process and uh and you know obviously they control the software so very very cool i love the fact that they're talking about how the um the 8 gig tablet uh nexus 7 could go down as low as 99 bucks uh making it incredibly affordable like i say that to me that's the next step in replacing textbooks right there Oh yeah, and they're definitely going after Apple. Like they're they're going for the jugular here. They definitely want to disrupt. They want they don't want anyone to buy an iPad Mini or the new iPad. They're they're you know they're going for broke for sure. Uh, maybe it's just Halloween, Andrew. But since when did Mobilicity turn evil? Since they launched their throttled premium data. Uh, if you remember last week or the week before, I was talking about. I thought these they had crazy- the best plans ever. They had the cheapest plans ever, but then the other shoe dropped. Uh, they, uh, they've they gone live with uh, what they're calling a 4G network, which isn't because it's not LTE. It's just, you know, a marketing marketing speak. It's uh, 21 uh, it's megabits one, per it's second. It's 1G better than 3G, though. I don't even know about that. I think it's, H- <laughs> it's what it really is if you're an engineer or, uh, you know, it's HSPA plus, but that's beside the point. They're just acronyms. So they they announced this premium data last week, and it's a twenty dollar add on for um, a limited amount of gigabytes. I think it's six gigabytes at regular speeds, and then you get throttled. 
What does this mean? Well, uh, talking about forums earlier, I'm a big fan of the Howard forums. Um, and I went on Howard forums to kind of get the blowback from this and big surprise. A lot of people who signed up for the 30, well, basically anyone who doesn't have this $20 premium data add on is getting like shit speeds down and up. There's somebody complaining uh, with the screen grab that they were basically getting 100 kilobits per second down uh, and 5 kilobits per second up, which is kind of like dial-up. <laughs> it's not kind of like dial-up. It is dial-up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not even ISDN, right? Because ISDN is like at least it's symmetrical. So it's uh, it's pretty horrible, and I think it's kind of despicable that they kind of pulled this bait and switch myself. Uh, so I am yeah, no so, longer so, recommending. Yeah, I was just going to say, let's be clear. This isn't, it's not one of these things where if you signed up for the $30 deal, you get to keep the $30 deal the way you signed up for it. They're totally removing all that stuff off the people who signed up over the past few weeks. Uh, no, that's not, I don't think so. I think they're being grandfathered so they can stay on that plan. However, their internet oh, it's the speed speeds, that's getting killed. Okay. Right. Yeah. Their speed just became the suck. And so now if you, yeah, if you want a halfway usable mobile device, you have to get the $20 add on and still their network, at least in Toronto is desperately in need of more towers. Uh, yeah. And I don't even think, uh, I think I checked it up a couple times. It doesn't even come into Hamilton yet. So no option for me. Yeah, it kind of sucks because I was with them for two years and there's a lot to really like about them. They're basically a prepaid carrier. You never had to worry about like a cell phone bill shock because the way that roaming worked, you had this online balance that they called a wallet. So you'd pay into that. And I remember when I was at South by Southwest, it's like I had a hundred bucks in there and it lasted me, I don't know, a couple hours. Uh, but then I wasn't charged after that. It was like, it was cool. And I could even go in the phone uh, like uh, to the Mobilisty mobile site and just like top it up and, and control how much I spent. So I thought that was great, but uh, this, not so much. Not so much. In fact, I would say that it has made you a prisoner to that account where we like to look for freedom. Yeah! Freedom! Yeah! I want to break something after I listen to that. Uh, Internet Archive, one of the coolest things about the Internet, I dare say. Um, not only is it the Internet Archive, archive.org, but you have the Wayback Machine, which, which archives you know the web throughout uh, its entire history, has now officially stored 10 petabytes or petabytes, depending on how you pronounce it, of information. Uh, if you don't know, that is what, 15 zeros? Uh, it looks like, yeah. Yeah, 15 zeros. So we are creeping up to where, um, I don't know how many, I don't know how many drives that would take, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm guessing it would take quite a few. Um, Including the redundancy or? Uh... Yeah, that's interesting by itself. Um, but I mean, I think it, it's fair to say that this is a service that should be celebrated because essentially you can put anything up there for completely free. Yep. And uh, I guess, the, and and you uh, have, if I'm not mistaken, I have. I've put a bunch of stuff up there, and uh, you make a you make a valid point in your uh, in your comment right within the show notes, which is who needs Netflix with this much free culture online? And if you go searching on there, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, like I say, there's a lot of stuff that you might not consider good too, because um, it is a vast, vast archive, and. Uh, it's one of these things that I don't think is well given to serendipity. Much like the web these days, it's not like something where you can just walk past and scroll by. Like in a, in a, in a book library, you walk past down an aisle and you might catch a book that you didn't even think you were interested in and you pick it up and start looking at it. Um, the web has gotten away from that. I remember when the web used to be like that. I remember when I was first you know, used to search online. I remember they used to talk about how shitty search engines were. I remember starting to use Yahoo way back in the day. And you would search for something and you get things that were totally unrelated, but that would sometimes lead you to very cool things. Um, that doesn't happen so much on Internet Archive. So it's like this huge amount of information, but you better know what you're searching because it's very difficult to browse effectively on this thing. But that being said, that's not taking away from it. The service is still absolutely amazing. And I don't know how you would actually, how you would actually make an interface whereby you could browse more effectively. We're going to see an app. We could. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Be pretty cool. I mean, you unless could you're on Mobilicity, of course. It's totally within you know shooting distance, anyways, of the ability to. 
uh, run algorithmic like stuff against the against the audio and the audio and video, and we already have the text stuff that's in OCRable or whatever sort of state. So we can ultimately do more and more search on that. But I, I think the real opportunity is in is in telling the story, being the leader of a something, be the guy that geeks out and searches through there and tells the tale of whatever it wants to be. The shopping mall, as seen through the history of the Internet Archive. I just knows? I love looking at the um one of the graphics halfway down the page shows all the hosts that Internet Archive crawls. So every dot com, every dot net, dot org, dot cn, dot ru, d e info, p l j p u k n l h u f r i t and c a. All of them are crawled and put into the Internet Archive. Oh, uh, and yeah, there's also the uh, Wayback Machine, which is um, affiliated, right? Right. That's part of the Internet Archive. Yeah. Right. So if you wanted to go to, I've done this because for my book, it's like I'm trying to find like old Fido pages to verify like the prices of uh, Ericsson's and yeah. odd Nokia's from days gone by. And you can actually do that. I've got uh, old web pages of mine back from should, 2003, 2002. I, I think I got one from 99 even on there. Um, old, old web pages that are on there. And some, most of them have the graphics missing because the graphics were in separate files and all of that stuff. And you used to host them in different places. But a lot of times the text is still there and the HTML file is still there. So it's a walk down memory lane. Sometimes not always a proud memory lane, mind you, but a memory lane nonetheless. So just a quick bit of math, like Newegg, 90 bucks for a one terabyte drive. Uh, we're basically talking about uh, 10,000 terabytes. It's like, you know, it's only $900,000 worth of drives at today's current market price. And if you buy them in bulk, you can probably get even a better price. There is something too that, <laughs> that uh, yeah, that that is only going to increase, right? Because with the number of di- the number of devices and things that could produce creativity and content that could be archived there, they're just going up. The number of computers, yeah. the number of devices, the number of cameras, and we're going to continue to record more and more and more and more and more of this. Um, and just, are we ever going back to look at it? It's it's interesting. They give you a, they give the stat here. They say that for one crawl of the internet. For all those do- those uh, master level domains that we talked about, um, they started on March 9th, two thousand eleven, and the crawl finished on December twenty third, two thousand eleven. Wow! Capturing two point seven billion uh, captures, uh, two point two eight billion unique URLs, and twenty nine million unique hosts. Uh, pretty incredible! Like it's numbers that start to become meaningless at some point. They're just like fucking big. But uh, yeah, kudos amazing it's there, though. Pardon me. Amazing it's there. And and Ryan, to your point about when when are we going to have time to watch all this stuff? This this may be a bit of an aside, but um, uh, another buddy of mine from Second City, Jack Mosshammer, who might be listening to this not uh, right now, but uh, he is shortly going to be leaving on a four month cruise, uh, wherein uh, on the boat they have uh, uh, satellite internet, which sucks, and it's uh, I think you pay by the minute or by the data transmission, like maybe the uh, not the terabyte, maybe the byte or the kilobyte. Uh, he's actually uh, based on what he heard on Discord. I think he's built himself a pirate box and he is going to be the rock star of the cruise, uh, sharing files wirelessly with uh, his fellow actors and other crew members. So kudos to him. There you go. Sounds awesome. Although, could you watch something like Titanic on the high seas? Would that be allowed? I don't think anyone could stop you if it's a pirate box. <laughs> as long as no one takes a picture of the security guards, I think you should be safe. <laughs> your own. Like- at the local pub and just pull you know audio and songs and <laughs> videos and other cool things off the archive in perpetuity <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't offer a stat how long would it take you to read all of this or listen to all of this it would take you 80 billion years Air Daily Drive was from LA and <laughs> Francisco that'd be a really long drive actually people fly that shit Anyway, it takes us to a section of the show where we like to look at some of the sometimes ridiculous, sometimes informative, and sometimes just plain inane things that we like to call the pew-pews. Pew! 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 No, no, not pew. Le pew. This is the best story ever. (laughs) At playbackonline.ca. I don't do this often, folks, but I would like to read you the entire article because this is an example of what I like to call terse journalism. 
It's sorry. It's <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. I'll let you finish. CRTC approves two new hockey channels. Hockey TV and Canal Hockey, both owned by Paul Girard, receive the green light from broadcast regulator Tuesday on the condition that they not broadcast live NHL games. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is one of those paywall websites, which makes the mistake of giving us the lead. <laughs> what was the other one? The Hill Times or something like that? Yeah, that's right. They give nice us to the, follow in their footsteps. Yeah, give us the goods, then we'll be gone. Isn't it? Uh, isn't it great to know that there's already at least two or three channels out there where they play uh, archive hockey games, and now we're adding two more channels to play archive to hockey games. I cannot believe on Saturday night uh, uh, they're still doing hockey night in Canada with <laughs> with old games. <laughs> like I was watching some random game with Wayne Gretzky and the, against the Leafs. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? I think watch the seventies game now and again, but not for their entire season. Yeah. Would you, would you rather watch a, uh, like uh, Republic of Doyle, Andrew? Um, well, <laughs> Oh, let me see my number one, two, three. Well, the Don Cherry story would have to be there. And then, uh, yeah, then the Don Cherry story up. part two. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Not having the the full uh, titles or what they're going to run on these channels other than rerun hockey games. I have to imagine there's going to be like cribs of hockey players. And Oh, you never saw Leafs TV when it was on a free – I used to have digital cable for a while and I had I had a free – they had a free thing for Leafs TV and I, I sat down and watched it for like a couple of times right here and there. All it was wall-to-wall old Leafs games, like no context or anything, just like – they probably went to archive.org and oh, just yeah. did a search for Maple Leafs. See so it goes to of MTV after MTV stopped playing music. I think one of these channels is English and one is French. That's why they got two of them. I think Canal Hockey is French because I think Canal Sank or Canal 5 is like a French uh, French production company. Um, Interesting thing. I did, a, I did a Google search for this guy, Paul Girouard, and the only thing I could find is from the Central Junior Hockey League uh, – all stars from what year is it? That's me scrolling up. Uh, oh no, they go back in years. Shit, not gonna find it because I saved it on the page. There's this long list of like all stars from years gone by. 1984, 1985 season on the second team playing left wing. Paul Girard from Gatineau. There you go. That's the only thing I can find in this guy. Um, all possible, and you need to pay for it. Yeah. Pew pew. pew pew. Pew pewed. Well, in my mind, what could be the story of the week? Well, for all the pop culture heads anyway. I'm surprised we've got this much pop culture in the show, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the story of the day definitely yesterday. George Lucas finally relinquishes his tight control of Star Wars to Mickey Mouse and the Disney Corporation. For just over $4 billion dollars. He sold the rights to essentially Star Wars and to the Raiders of the Lost Ark being the two, the Indiana Jones series being the two most prominent properties there. I, I, did he sell like Skywalker Studios as well? I don't know if he did or not, but. I'm, I'm just reading through the comments in the first one. <laughs> Damn it. I wish I had thought of this. <laughs> first one is no. Yeah. Um, Who knows? They're talking about now that uh, Disney is planning a new Star Wars Episode 7 for 2015 and that they will continue with Star Wars properties ad infinitum. There will probably be new Indiana Jones films, a whole bunch of stuff like that, too. Here's the thing. I mean, I don't know if, like, like me, you guys were big fans of Star Wars growing up. I was a huge fan of Star Wars growing up. Like, absolutely nuts. So when I think that there may be a new film out, part of me says... You know, yes, because I love the fact that there would be a new Star Wars film out. But then episodes one, two, and three did so much to destroy my childhood love for the series. And that, that's not to say that they were horrible films, but they certainly didn't live up to my expectations. I don't know if you guys had felt the same way about Star Wars or still feel the same way about Star Wars as I do with regards to this Disney transfer. Enjoyed the three movies that I knew as, you know, like the Star Wars trilogy. And then as Bootprint in the chat points out, uh, as, as soon as I saw Jar Jar, within seconds of Jar Jar, the rest of the thing was done for me. End of it. Yeah, same. The, the only funny thing about the um, 
the second trilogy of movies or the first, depending on how you like it. Episodes one, two, and three was that I remember being in my apartment uh, and they just opened a new multiplex theater down the street from where I lived. And there are these like, it sounded like there were like uh, older gentlemen having a lightsaber fight in the alley below my window. <laughs> <laughs> that that was kind of fun in a retarded way. Son was uh, Luke Skywalker. Um, how- yeah. In it, in addition, though, in addition to the films, they also have all the rights to the marketing as well. And well, the, that's where the money is, right? And that's the cash cow, right? So you can. Bet- oh, my fucking my nephew has the uh, has the Lego stuff, and it's like, look, I'm almost done this thing, this Lego thing that I have to follow the explicit directions in the box. I'm like, that's not Lego. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but that is not Lego. <laughs> it's Blocko. <laughs> it's follow instructions, oh, and don't think for yourself, oh. <laughs> Um, anyway, it was definitely the, the story of the day yesterday and people couldn't believe it. I don't know if we lost you, Ryan. You've been kind of cutting in and out as you go along, but you're coming up. You well, know, you're kind of dipping in and out. And I don't know if you're, are you downloading star Wars as we're recording tonight? Is that it? No. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, George Lucas gives it up and ensures that it will be copyrighted for the rest of eternity. Meh. Yeah, Exactly. Pew, pew pew. Anyway, um, there is to be apparently anonymous is going to launch a WikiLeaks like project called Tyler to launch in December. Um, I don't know. Does it say? Did it say anywhere why this was called what it was? No, and the headline is incredibly misleading. Like when I read this, it, that it's called it's from this site called Parody News. And the title is "Anonymous WikiLeaks Like Project Tyler to Launch in December." And it's like, what is that? Facebook is who's Tyler? The fuck is Tyler? Tyler is a P2P encrypted software um, program which enables people to submit information anonymously, not unlike WikiLeaks. And uh, the reason why this exists is because uh, Anonymous feels betrayed by WikiLeaks and their paywall. So um, so they're going to put up it. a fully distributed version of WikiLeaks so if somebody shares something, anyone can download it right away kind of thing. Like the protection is in the in the distribution. Right, and it can't be shut down because it's got redundancy everywhere. Now, so. I'm curious as to whether Tyler, and this is a stretch, but as soon as I saw the name, this is what, it, to me, I thought of Tyler Durden, the character from Fight Club. So you had the uh, the Ed Norton character and the Brad Pitt character, and spoiler alert, a decade later... They were both actually like the same character or reflection of uh, one another. So. Damn it, I was just going to watch that. Seems Fuck. like you're talking about that. Uh, I don't know. I'm just saying. Now Anonymous is going to come after us. Yeah, we like Anonymous, right? They're awesome. The way they found the um, all the cyber bullies and stuff. All I'm we, saying don't is don't take that our site down. Consider this. Consider the Discultured Podcast a leak. <laughs> And if you would like to share it on a P2P network, feel free. You don't even get other than just, you know, funny show to listen to. Maybe Well, you code our way to. Um, yeah. One of the reasons Anonymous is doing this, we talked about that kind of faux paywall that they set up. Um, so that's right. one of the reasons that they don't like it. So pew, pew, look for Tyler. Uh, I know this will be Rywise story of the week. Journalism professors using clout scores as part of students' grades. Oh, tell me who who submitted this? Was this you, Andrew? Yeah, I found it. So this guy Todd Basile from Florida State University argues that even if people think clout is inaccurate or silly, Ryan, since others are taking it seriously, students need to take it seriously too. Even if it's a problem, uh, sorry, even if it's a problem perpetuating situation, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, he argues that it being something of a realist and merely preparing his students for the real world. Where, where they will be judged by their clout stores, scores whether they like it or not. <laughs> I think I just threw up all over my microphone. It's one thing if you just said, like if you said like social media douchebags, blah, 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 blah. But when you see journalism professors, you have to question the school, don't you? <laughs> don't you have Are to- you saying Florida State University is not the preemptive journalism school in North America, oh, sir? Oh, I think it's, I think it's definitely preemptive. I don't know if it's preeminent, that's for sure. <laughs> I'd say many junior journalist schools are trying a hard time to f- 
having a hard time trying to figure out just exactly what they need to teach or what to who and is it media and other digital and other things. It's a tough time for journalism schools, I would, I dare say. Uh, I think, well, yeah, it's a tough time for them to get half-decent professors, it looks like. Well, I mean, if this is what's happening on the teaching side, oh. the thing, I again, it comes back to the gaming, right? Like, when you were, t- yeah, no, I'm going to bug. Like, I mean, like, they say clout matters to employers. No, it doesn't. Clout doesn't matter to employers. Most employers, 99%, well, 99% of, of employers don't know what the fuck clout is. <laughs> Like, they may know what Facebook is. They may want to see how many friends you got. They may know what Twitter is. They may want to see how many follow- followers you've got. 99.9%, I dare say, of employers don't know what the fuck cloud is. And so to say it matters to employers is absolute bullshit. But that's good. If we're not in the room, you know, or someone with a similar voice, then it gets sold to whoever. I don't know. Well, it gets, it gets sold to the students, and the students aren't going to complain because they want their grades better. Their yeah. grades or their cloud scores? Oh. Is your mind blown? Anyone? Anyone? A little bit? My, My mind is blown like a double pew pew to the head. Pew pew! Anyway, we are moving on. We are done the links. We're getting to longer and longer shows, eh? Which to me doesn't mean anything, but I just thought I'd mention it. No, I'm trying to get them shorter. I'm trying to like, I'm thinking in my head, I was trying to get like eight stories and four pew pews, but even then we're still like overclocking in at close to 90 minutes. So I know. If, if anyone out there thinks the show's too long, let us know and we'll see what we can do. Because we certainly don't mind talking. That's not ever our problem. I'm just saying. Uh, hang on. We've got some identity theft happening in the shout outs this week, Andrew. Uh, yeah, Chimo, uh, who's following us on Twitter and also Identica, I believe. Uh, uh, found a flatter site uh, with the username Discultured. What? And it's not ours. Because you set one up, didn't you? I don't know if I did or not. Yeah, you did. Uh, let me log in and see if it's mine. I don't think it is, though, because the icon is like, it looks like two yams roasting in an oven with like film reels on it. That's not something I would do. Well, I, I remember, I'm, pretty sure i remember you set one up once now i don't know whether we ever because we actually had a button up on the website at one time Mm, okay hang on let me let me see so i'm on my (laughs) dashboard now i logged in this is this this is what we call exciting podcasting entertainment folks Uh, no it's not it's not listed as one of my see i flatter is so confusing i don't even know what I'm not even sure where to look, but on my list of my things, what Flatter calls them, there's only my blog uh, and my Flickr page. There's nothing nothing for Disculture at all. I am giving but, Andrew a minus one in clout for Flatter. Yeah, like, I give a fuck. Here <laughs> <laughs> now. Part, what was that? Am I here now? You're, you're, you've been fading in and out all show, dude, and I don't know what it is, but... Slur appears to be live, but the, somebody in the chat room asked me. Like your your sound, you come in strong and then you kind of dip down back to the back again. I don't know what it's been all show, but we've kind of lived with it because it's been kind of okay. But when you listen back to it, you'll hear it. Yeah, well, I guess I disappeared there for a while because I was trying to say things and you just kept there was just going moving on. Oh, hmm. so good. Let's go back. Yeah, maybe your close score <laughs> wasn't high enough. <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, oh Christ, this <laughs> float is like. Is, is that my ISP that's uh, tracking me on behalf of Clout? I spoke uh, ill of them. Yeah, could be. Maybe that's... So anyway, that, that Disculture Flatter account is definitely not ours, but thanks for bringing it to our attention. Yes, indeed. It's and we should also thank the people in the chat. Yes. If anybody's still there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we, we've been keeping later. them on. And so we got uh, Bootprint, Haywood, the real Mike M. Uh, we had Sacred Groove in there earlier, too. I think he had to go. He's got youngins. So, uh, so he, uh, I think he headed off, but... Small group in the chat, but it is Halloween night, so we don't necessarily expect that we're going to get a lot of our West Coasters um, because, you know, they're out giving candy away or eating remainder candy, whatever that may be. Uh, what kind of music are we going to listen to tonight on the way out, Andrew? Uh, some Star Wars music, and it's actually not bad. It's not like a parody song per se. It's uh, some pretty cool hip-hop, and I found this just uh, – I, I spent about an hour searching for something half-decent, uh, and what I ended up with is uh, this band. They're called uh, Two Skinny Jays. Uh, and they're banned from, I believe, somewhere in the States, and they actually have a music store, and I actually bought this track. Uh, I'm not wow. sure if the license... 
I paid 99 US cents, which is like what, 100 bucks Canadian? Um, it's the other way around now, I think. All right. Well, in any case, uh, I paid money for the song. I'm not sure if the license that I have for the song allows me to broadcast it to a wider network on this podcast. But if anyone from andyactionfulfillment.com is listening to this and wants to get in touch with me about what my license permits me to do and not do, uh, I'm all ears. Leave a comment on the blog. Just uh, make sure you leave your identity. All I know is that if it's a Star Wars song, they are now suffering the wrath of Disney. So I don't think they'll want to try and sue us. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, so it's a good thing I got it when I did. So the uh, the track is called uh, Irresistible Force, and I, I thought it was pretty cool. So, you know, I thought it was worth paying 99 cents for it. So you guys get to listen to it for free. Very, very cool. So we'll listen to that on the way out tonight. Uh, Mr. Ryan Wiseman, why don't you tell people where they can find you when you're not fading in and out with us here on the Disc Culture Podcast every week? Am I here? Am I coming in uh, loud and clear? This is uh, Ryan Wiseman. You can <laughs> uh, at Wiseman on the Twitter or uh, takeonthewebcom there you go. Andrew. See, you just cut out again. You're cutting out, I tell you. Balls. I caught it. I heard it. Andrew. Yeah, I heard part of it. <laughs> I'll run with it. Uh, I'm at myphonebook.ca, working through the second draft of the book, which will hopefully be out mid-December, certainly in time for Christmas. Uh, Mr. Marco. You can find all of my podcasts at anthonymarco.com. You can find me on Twitter at Anthony Marco. And you can find all of the Discultured podcasts at discultured.com. You can find us in your favorite podcast aggregator by searching Discultured. Email us at discultured at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at Discultured. And submit links for episode 210 to discultured.reddit.com. And Discultured is always spelled with the letter Y. Why is that in as short parlance as you can, Mr. Wiseman? Uh, why not cruise cbc.ca, find an article for next week's show, and check out their really cool pull quotes. <laughs> pull quotes. Thank you, sir. There we go. He got that parlance down, didn't he? Yeah, yeah it's a good job. Yeah, he did. Anyway, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you, everybody in the chat. You've been awesome for uh, putting up with us with another long episode this week. But hey, we'd appreciate your feedback, whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether you think it was worth Andrew spending 99 cents on the song that you're about to hear, or whether you have any comments or criticism at all. Just lay it on us. You know, our egos can handle it. We're tough. Yeah. Pay, paywalls, too. Interested in what you think about paywalls. Yeah. Paywall links. Let us know. Anyway, that's it for this week. At the count of three, I would like everybody to say, trick or treat. One, two, three. Treat. Or trick. Get on your feet. Now time is over. With the quickness, can I get a witness like Jehovah? Amen. Keep it up till I say when. Now I'm busting out the playpen. It's the era of Jake Rivera. Sparking revolutions like in one time. I'm now like Laura getting played from the hands of the creator. Locus devouring all the hocus pocus. About to explode like the phone now. Mean and green, so check my signal. It's the skinny individual who did you well. I can't you not. I think you stop if you got to scheme. Cause my team bring the steam like I wonder from my oasis. And the race is right. Now it's time to take my place in the sun. You can't deny the force. Resistance is evil. We got more plans on approval. It's not the time to dance, it's just a few. Get futile, it's brutal. So much sense and pain, so eager that the foreign symbols all suspended sense. Self suppression of evidence will be that with full And If you hesitate, then it's good luck to present your tent. Hence, your confession is expected if you think they were present. Blessed are we who come in the name of Jay. I would spread like a oh, I declare it's a state of emergency. The present and a sense, so don't expect the reality to bend on me. My penalty is it unforgiving that you can't resist the skin to so give yourself a moving. But still, I feel the warm emotion while you see. Cross, 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 we can't deny the force. Irresistible force.